So this is the Speaking Up for Safety podcast. Today we are joined with a Refugee Connection. My name is Michael Stone. I'm the Traffic Safety Program Manager. And the other person we have on staff today is Taylor Steed. He's our program manager and he's the smartest man I know. I brought him on today to fill in my knowledge gaps where I don't have them because I'm just a humble social science major where he is a big time public health safety and administration master's holder. And so I brought him on so that we actually have some intelligent conversation on the podcast. It's not just me up here rambling. So I'll turn time over to Taylor to introduce himself. And then we'll get to our two guests of Amy and Amanda. Perfect. Well, just like Michael said, my name is Taylor Steed. I'm one of the occupational program managers here at the Utah Safety Council. Uh, and while a lot of what we do is related to occupational safety and health, a lot of this can be extended toward the field of refugees when it comes to disadvantaged populations. And so here we at the Utah Safety Council just want to get the word out to help as many people as we can. Perfect. And would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Amy Dot Harmer, and I'm the executive director for Utah Refugee Connection. And um, the goal of Utah Refugee Connection is it, it's twofold. On the side of refugees, we fill gaps in services in the refugee community in Utah, which there's 65,000 to 85,000 refugees in Utah. Um, And what we do is we work with a lot of organizations and people that are supporting their efforts to become part of our community and looking at what the gaps are. And then on the other side of it, we are trying to educate the general community on ways to learn about, serve, and give to refugees. And so we take those two things and kind of match them together. There are a lot of people that want to do things to make a difference for refugees in our community, but don't really know what to do. So we have this lovely opportunity to share meaningful ways to learn, serve, and give. And we largely do that through our social media feed, which is Serve Refugee on Serve Refugee. It's Serve Refugees on Facebook, Instagram, and now X. And every day we're posting um, in the general community ways like I said, to be engaged with refugees in ways that are meaningful to the refugee community. And then Amanda, a couple of years ago, like I said, we fill gaps in services and we discovered one of the gaps during an event that we had during COVID. We had a Mother's Day drive through event and because we couldn't gather. And what we discovered is women were coming through to get a gift and to to be honored on Mother's Day is how many of them did not have car seats or the appropriate car seats. And it led us to some really interesting thoughts about, okay, these are new drivers. These are people that, you know, don't have a lot of income and they're maybe unaware. They've been in countries where you have six people on the back of a motorcycle. So we needed to think about ways to pivot. And then Luckily, we came across having Amanda, and Amanda has worked filling to fill that gap and is a car seat tech, and it's just it's been an awesome opportunity. Maybe Amanda mm-hmm. can tell a little bit more about what her specific job entails. So after I got hired, um, Amy asked me if I'd be willing to go and take a car seat class, and I've had four children, and I thought, oh sure, what is what's that going to entail? You know, a one day couple of hours and then they signed me up for the class and it was a week long five day full day every day class which was mind-blowing that there was that much information that could be um could be shared about car seats and so since then we've worked I've been able to work one-on-one with refugee um, parents and which has been a really unique experience because often there are language barriers and cultural barriers and and um but to be able to help them understand more uh ways that they can help their children stay safe as they are traveling in their car perfect i actually have a question if i could sure. ask real quick um 
So just to give some background details, according to the state of Utah's public health indicator-based information system, in 2020, there were 261 refugee arrivals. Now, the definition of that is arrival numbers include all populations supported by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. In 2021, that number increased to 1,057. In 2022, it was 1,539. And in 2023, it was 1,869. So that's the highest that Utah has seen since tracking the statistics since 1998. And I guess the question I have is, since we're seeing this increase of new arrivals, is Utah just accepting more refugees in general, or are there just more refugees in general? Okay, so this is a complex question, and I'll try and fetter out (laughs) a little bit, is um, not many people know this, but, but decades ago, the United States signed on to uh, an agreement with many countries saying after World War II, all of us will agree to take in refugees. And everyone kind of put into the pot how much they could assist. And um, we've, we in the United States obviously are built a lot on immigrants and new arrivals. And I think at the time that seemed a logical step in in helping assist when there's conflict around the world. And so um, that's one one thing that contributes to the United States being an, a country that asks as, as, as to be able to help refugees. The second interesting thing that a lot of people don't understand is whoever is the president of the United States can determine the number of refugees that are allowed in the United States. And, and that's challenging in that the numbers are never consistent, even though there's more warfare and more challenges that are facing refugees, but it fluctuates based on how a president and um, the, how the president feels about those numbers. So during different, uh, different presidents' time frame or tenure, it can radically change. So, for example, during the Obama administration, we saw huge numbers, like hundreds, 100,000 refugees or more coming to the United States. During Trump, it dropped down to 12,000. So that's a huge change in numbers. And so this, this waxing and waning of how many individuals we have is really challenging on the ground level because... If you go from 100,000 to 12,000 refugees, you that changes the nonprofit scene on the ground level. And, and, and the U.S. government agrees to help support refugees for the first 90 days that they're here. And so if you're a nonprofit that typically has received funding to help refugees when they first arrive, and it changes from 100,000 to 12,000, that's a pretty substantial change. And so, unfortunately, I would love to not have a job. I would love to know there (laughs) wouldn't be any refugees, but the reality is there's conflict around the world. And we know anytime there's conflict, there are going to be people fleeing. And we misuse a lot of terms like displaced person, asylum seeker, migrant, refugee. In order to actually be termed an official refugee, um, the United Nations High Commission of Refugees, there's certain checkpoints and background checks, and it's not easy to be given the title of refugee. And so I think people kind of misunderstand, you know, we have over 65 million displaced people right now. And, you know, what's going on right now in Israel isn't a perfect example of when there's conflict, you are going to have displaced people. And um, those that cannot stay in a country because if they stay, they'll be killed are those that are refugees and have refugee status. And so it isn't that we, we do have a lot more refugees, but also the numbers change based on um, who the president is. And, and right now we have a president that is more willing to allow refugees to come into the United States. We also had a huge increase in Ukrainians and a huge increase in the Afghan population. And, you know, some of those situations were 
part of our making, you know, Afghanistan, when we pulled out, it put a lot of vulnerable people in a desperate situation. So, you know, in the last few years, we've seen a substantial increase in those. But your question of why are we all of a sudden seeing more isn't because the numbers worldwide, I mean, yes, they have increased, but it's largely because of the president determining how many people are allowed in. And Utah is a very welcoming state. So, you know, we we do a lot to create a safe environment for refugees. So did I answer no, that question? No, you absolutely I'm sorry, answered my question. No, thank you. It was no, a little long. You. It's a little no, more complex worry. than just, oh yeah, there's more people here. It it There's lots of things that contribute to that increase no, in numbers. Absolutely. I think that's something that I hope that our listeners really can understand is that this is a very complex issue, yeah. that there's a lot that goes into this that a lot of people don't know about. I'm sure most people here probably didn't know that the president is the one who decides how many refugees yeah. get in. Did you know, Mike? Like, I did not know. I didn't realize that it was kind of like by administration who will allow people in. And yeah. one thing you did mention as well is that the, the definition between a displaced person and refugee, like what's kind of the dividing barrier between so, the two. So displaced people people are anyone that are fleeing their their country of origin or their home and they don't technically have any status as of yet. They just know they can't stay. And so the in in the media we use this term refugee a lot of times when I think really what we mean is displaced person and that displaced people can become migrants, they can become asylum seekers, they can become humanitarian parolees. But those that have refugee status are those that have gone through the whole process of having their background checked, um, checking their stories to make sure they're really fleeing, that there's no other option. If they stay, they'll be killed or very likely not survive. Mm. So. That, that's maybe helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Yeah, yeah. And one other thing you'd mentioned is that, uh, like, the United States government's willing to help people out for the first 90 days of them being here. Do your guys' services extend beyond those 90 oh, days? Oh, this is another wild question. And, <laughs> and Amanda and I see this every day. So typically in Utah, for many years, refugees were able to receive services of case management for two years, which is amazing. You know, if you're... Uh, a single mom don't speak the language and you move to a new country and you have a whole new culture, two years is really nice to get on your feet. Um, because of some of these changes with, you know, the fluctuating numbers with, with um, the president determining how many refugees, the case management has really dropped to more of a year and sometimes just six months. And Utah is unique in that we've had a lot of support to help this. And and I really believe the more support we give refugees initially, the better they're able to start contributing and become a vibrant part of our community. If we just barely get them launched and they're not quite ready, it's actually really hard. I would love to see case management really be more of a year to two years, but the reality is there isn't funding for it. Um, but one of the 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 question of, you know, if you thought about going to another country where a different language is spoken, how fast do you think you could get on your feet if you didn't know the culture or the language and you were expected to work and pay rent? Well, and this is something John mentions to me almost daily. They threw me through one semester of Spanish. <laughs> and what I learned is how to conjugate verbs yes. for four months. And so if they asked me to conjugate verbs, I got that. But if yeah. you expect me to speak and immerse myself in the culture, not at all. Yeah. And that was a formal education yes, where a dropped. lot of stuff is learned, I would assume, is through yeah. informal means. It's from interacting with your neighbors, from interacting yeah. with your case managers. Um, I bet you, you, Andy, you'd probably deal with a lot of individuals who probably don't speak much English. No, Google Translate uh, is my friend. And see, and that's actually a good question that I have is what has been the role of technology in helping you in meeting the needs of refugees? First of all, I have to say Amanda is amazing. Good. Because we, <laughs> I mean, it would be one thing if we just have some Spanish, but we have, I mean, probably 30 different languages. And she is really good at sign language and learning on the fly. And you could maybe talk a little bit about Google Translate and how you, what you find is effective in communicating to these parents what they need to know. 
Yeah. Sign language does help quite a bit. And and what I'm doing is a demonstration. So I'm teaching them about a car seat. So I physically have a tool to, and and then I can follow up with Google Translate. Um, but generally, I I start out with Google Translate so they understand what I'm going to be communicating. I, I don't think I could do it as effectively without it and feel so grateful. There are times where I chuckle because I'll read I'll read what it translated because I'll speak into my phone and then it will speak to whomever I'm working with. And, and I do laugh because sometimes it'll throw in a funky word, but, (laughs) but at the same time, it's way better than me just speaking English to them. And so many times I've thought I need to go and learn Spanish or, um, I recently just picked up Duolingo and started to try and learn. I took French in middle school. And so I, it is not easy. And so it's good to be on that end of it as well to understand it's really tricky for them. And it's amazing the children that come in, the five-year-olds and, you know, five to 13-year-olds that'll come in and translate for their parents in perfect English and not even a, an accent. And they catch on really, really quickly. So that is a real benefit to some families. But also, um, it's something that a parent can't lean on 24 hours a day when they're functioning in, in our communities. I think one thing to add with the car seats is we actually have a van um, bench inside our building. Mm-hmm. So Amanda will use the van bench that's just in our building to demonstrate how to use the appropriate car seat. Mm and model how to do it in this this van. And I think there's some things that cause parents to be more engaged is first of all, when they know it has something to do with their children mm-hmm. and their children's safety, um, I think they're they're much more engaged because they want their kids to be safe. And the whole reason they came here is to be safe. So I really think it's beautiful that Amanda has the actual item that they were trying to utilize to keep their child safe and she can demonstrate how to use it inside Mm -hmm. on a van bench that's you know got seat belts and then she can demonstrate that and then I can let them practice and then they can Mm -hmm. practice and then she can observe them putting it in their own Mm -hmm. car so I think that's really helpful because it's all hands-on in front of you and it has to do with the safety of your kid. And I, I can honestly say that if I were in a new country and I had someone teaching me about a way to keep my child safe, I would be much more engaged than probably anything else. Because as a mother, that's one of my biggest priorities is to keep my child safe. Do you ever encounter situations where there may be some refugees who don't understand the reason as to why this is required or might be hesitant toward it? Do you ex- experience anything like that? Generally, the the um, the refugees that we see uh, do have some understanding, usually through a caseworker, some mm. some type of education that or just even being told, you know, you need this. Um, but that's where our drive-through event is really key because it's not it's not a one and done situation. Nobody ever you know does it right usually the first time. It takes practice. And so catching catching those mistakes and and reeducating is also really key as far as um well, I'm sure many things, not just the car seats, but but as far as our program, it's been really helpful. So one thing I want to add, like if you um, look at many pictures from Africa to, um, I mean, many places, whatever way you can find transportation, you use. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you'll see a mom and a dad and a kid and a baby on the mom's back riding a motorcycle. That's the reality is, you know, they, they haven't thought a lot about that. and so. The cultural difference here, too, is that we're a lot more mindful of those things because we've had privilege to 
have cars that are big enough for our families and we've had the things that we need. And, you know, one of the reasons car seats became such a challenge is number one, we want those kids to be safe. But number two, a car seat is expensive. And if for these families, if you're choosing between food and a car seat, you're going to choose food. And the other thing is, is you're like, well, we've been in doing tra- transporting our families this way for ever in our country. So why do we need to do it here? But then it takes getting maybe a ticket and a ticket is expensive. And if that money takes away from paying rent or buying the food that you need, it's a pr- it can be a domino effect of, okay, now things are spilling over. And, you know, these are frequently new drivers. And so we hear of an accident probably once a month and some of them are minor fender benders, but then a lot of times they're more significant. You know, you add snow, especially to cultures that have never had snow. Um, You think about these kids riding unrestrained or even the parents. And it isn't that they're, they want to elude the law. It's just that they don't have an understanding and um, sometimes the cost is prohibitive for them. So I think it isn't just they want to break the law. It's just that this is a new concept. So making sure like I think when you, when you came to our Mother's Day event, um, Michael, you probably realized that um, it's really important to treat them with dignity and not conclude that you're not a smart parent because you can't do this. It's more because maybe they don't have an understanding or don't realize how important it is. The other thing that's super challenging is they can't afford a full size van when you've got a lot of kids. And so car seats make it so you can't fit as many people. So there, the, it isn't just so much they want to elude police, you know, there's so many more things that are are challenging for them but it's like the more information you have you do better and so little by little what we're trying to do is increase the amount of information and understanding they have so they do better Mm -hmm. yeah certainly like you were touching on earlier like none of these parents don't want their kids to be safe they genuinely want that they fled their country because they want their kids to be safe so they have a very high level of caring it's just lack of knowledge and resources, all that it came down to. Cause like I saw a three-year-old still in an infant carrier yeah, and they're like, we didn't know when it was time to switch. They're like, we have one in the trunk. We can go grab it and switch it out. I'm like, let's do that then. Let's <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it is really important that everyone that we serve, you know, on, on our staff, we really believe that we want every individual to be seen safe and supported. And when you acknowledge a person as an individual that has value and purpose in our community, that goes a long way. But then ultimately the idea is that we cherish these people because of what they can bring to our community. But I loved that, you know, it wasn't, Oh, you're doing this wrong and you're so bad when you drive through, but like, Hey, let's help you and let's give you the resources that you need so you can be successful and you can keep this, these family members safe. So we appreciate that. And, and I think sometimes some cultural sensitivity is really important. Law enforcement, um, is, plays a critical role too in helping refugees, you know, their background typically has been anyone in uniform is dangerous. They've been killed, set on fire, raped by men in uniform. And so they're terrified of, the possibility of law enforcement engaging because they're like, this is what they've done in my own country. So can I trust them? And so we also have really tried really hard to engage law enforcement in positive ways. So the first experience they have with law enforcement is a positive one, like helping them put in a car seat, Mm -hmm. um, giving out creamies at world refugee day and, you know, instead of coming quickly to judgment that these parents don't care about their children if they're not using a car seat, it's that they maybe lack understanding of what's required here because really the reason they love their country is to keep their family safe. 
And so sometimes just having an awareness of those things is really important. Um, if I could uh, add a little bit, um, shifting gears a tiny bit more toward the health side of refugees. Um, in, in the field of public health, we have what are called the social determinants of health, mm -hmm. where those are the conditions in which people born, grow, work, live, and involves the wider set of forces and systems that shape our conditions of daily life. And those five aspects are education, access and quality, health care and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community contexts, and economic stability. And one of the things that, that the common thread here is it's actually really hard to achieve any of the social determinants of health without something like a car seat, without having those positive experiences with law mm -hmm. enforcement. Because if you don't have these resources, if you don't have access to some of this stuff, it can be really hard to be successful. Because um, if you have, let's say, an individual who they have just got accepted into school, and it's, okay, well, great. Well, I have to bring my child along with me. How do I do that? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a car seat. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we want to give them these, um, act, we want to give these resources and these uh, opportunities to enhance their lives, but without doing the fundamental stuff of keeping people safe with car seats, with having positive interactions. Okay, so it's interesting that you're bringing this up. And I would love you to tell me the first one. The first social determinant yeah. of health, so, yeah. education, access, and quality. Okay. Just that could be a whole podcast. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, in the refugee community, you have people that have never learned how to write mm. in their own language, and you have people that have been doctors in their countries. It's a huge spectrum. Um, we have at least... You know, 50% of refugees are children and mothers. And if you look at um, refugee camps, very few have access to education. That's one of the most heartbreaking things to me. And so if you're coming from a background where you're not educated in your own language, you know, Amanda can, can say, like, when we have refugees write their name, Amanda, maybe you can say a little bit about what that's like. I mean, it's, it, it blows your mind. It really does. Well, and, and we'll often have them write their name in both languages because they're practicing. Um, but it is it takes a lot of time. And you, if you have had children and you've helped your child learn to read and write, it is, I'm going to get a little emotional, sorry. But it is amazing because here you are, there's a, 30 year old woman in front of you who is practicing like your kindergartner would practice. And it is, you just want to cheer them on. It's amazing. But yeah, it, uh, and the number of times I've had a husband and wife come and whether through Google translate or, or just in general, she actually has more education than he does. So she will interpret for him or um, read it through Google translate for for the husband and that's situational because the woman maybe was at home with with a parent who valued that education and helped her to learn but then he was out working and and missed out on that aspect as well so there are a lot of so that the the educational component like you just you take it for granted but it's also really amazing some of the stories like there was a a Somali girl who um was really excited to know that when she came to the United States, she was going to be able to go to school. And when she got here, the paperwork had taken so long. And by the time she got here, she was no longer high school aged. And when refugees get here, they're expected to work right away. Well, guess where she, her first job was at the University of Utah helping clean. And every day she saw people that were living her dream of being educated. And it bothered her so much, she decided to do something about it and started going to English classes, eventually got accepted to the U and on scholarship and was actually um, the commencement speaker a couple of years ago and is now in medical school. And, you know, when you, you think about refugees, they, they you know, our, our, our ingenuity intelligence, creativity are all universal skills mm -hmm. 
but opportunities are not. So that's the first one. Okay, give me your second health determinant. <laughs> uh, it would be healthcare and quality. Oh, so this is another really interesting one, like where, you know, you'll have some refugees that have had access to education or are not education to medical care, but you have some that have never had any kind of engagement with a medical practitioner in any way. So if you just take going to the optometrist for the first time and you've never seen a medical environment or been there and someone puts those little goggles on you uh, to figure out your vision, how foreign that is. And so, you know, refugee camps frequently, uh, they haven't had access to a lot of medical care. I have one dear refugee friend who... And Amanda knows her that was actually born so early they threw in the garbage because they didn't think there was a way to save her. And fortunately, a medical care person that had some skills heard about this baby and actually took her out of the garbage can and saved her and nursed her into health. Her mom died in childbirth. But um, I remember hearing her speak as a 13-year-old saying, I was reborn twice, once when I was taken out of a garbage can and then when I got to the U.S. And now she's at the U of U on scholarship with one of the jazz scholarships. So like, okay, so th these determinants of health, like you're seeing how disadvantaged some of these people come. Okay, what's your next one? <laughs> uh, neighborhood and built environment. Okay, this is something I actually think refugees are really good at yeah. <laughs> and we see it at events they really believe the village mentality and maybe mm -hmm. you can talk about <laughs> like they come to an event and everyone's supposed to help with the kids yeah it well it's a group effort and and they also i mean it is immediate community one of the beautiful things that we actually get to see is how the community even extends um because uh, we so it, one of the things that we do is uh, refugees can earn resources by going to English classes and um, and other types of classes. And, and so they will then go to classes with women from other cultures. So you've got Afghan women with um, uh, Hispanic, South American mm -hmm. women, um, maybe Ukrainian. It doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. And then they come into our share house and we see them know each other. And their kids know each and other. And they're talking. And, and they're speaking. And they don't yeah. speak all the same language other than English. So they have to mm -hmm. practice English. English. But like my favorite, I have it on video, is this 80-year-old lady that was going to English classes. And she was so proud that she could count to 10. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I love watching that video to see like, oh, man, she's so excited about learning. And, and you know, we try really hard. Even though I speak Spanish when they come in, we try really hard to to make them try and communicate in English because you have got to have a way to communicate with the public when you're in that environment. But a lot of um, these uh, refugees come from very tribal backgrounds. You know, there's some tribes where they take out their two front teeth and that's how you know what tribe they're from. Or they have pin pricks across their forehead for different tribes so they know each other and you see and you start to learn, you know, which communities are which based on that. Um, some women have certain fragrances. It's really mm -hmm. interesting, like the things that pull them together and you start to learn some of their cultural characteristics and they actually are really good at building community. Um, and I think one of our challenges in Utah is we're really good at in, in pulling people into our things like inviting them to our stuff. But my favorite is to go to their stuff, mm. like baby showers and, and their, their, their church or mm. the ways that they gather because they're really beautiful. And they, we don't have the corner on the best way to gather, but that's at least one social, the, the, the health determinant that they do fairly well in. But we need to make sure they feel a sense of community here.
Perfect. And that that is perfect because you also answered the social and community context as to why that's important. Mm -hmm. Having that shared feeling of we are in this together. We're finally in a place now where we are not being persecuted, where we can finally pursue these opportunities that have been taken from them. Yeah. And I think that helping any individual is going to excel who feels safe, seen and supported. Correct. So whether it's a teenage 16-year-old or it's Michael or it's Taylor, if you know someone sees you, you know someone is supportive of you, you're safe, you ultimately start to feel cherished and then you feel like you have something to give back. And I think that's what largely our goal is, not only with refugees, but with donors that come in to offer things to refugees. We want them to know where is this going and build a, a, a serve, you know, our social media feeds called Serve Refugees. And I love calling it the Serve Refugees community because really they help all these individuals that are newcomers feel safe, seen, and supported. And then at the end of the day, that leads to the last um, social determinant of health, and that's economic stability. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Big one. This is a big win. Um, I think in the last few years, we've seen some real challenges in our own community um, with affordable housing, livable wages. Now you think about having eight kids and you're from a foreign country, you don't speak the language and you have 45 days to get on your feet. Um, What economic stability means to you is really different. You know, some of us don't think twice about having the menstrual supplies we need or a car seat um, or basic food. Um, And I think what we're determining is one of the biggest challenges right now is, well, several, is people that are employers that are refugee friendly and can help refugees progress in, in, in a an employee environment that also are patient with the language. Um, Cache Valley is doing a really good job with refugees and employing them because they have so many industries in Cache Valley where language is not a major issue, you know, like manufacturing facilities. Um, But if you can't have a livable wage, and you don't have support after, you know, 45 days or 90 days or a year, it's going to be pretty hard. So so economic stability is really challenging. Affordable housing. We used to see refugees mostly in South Salt Lake because there was affordable housing. But what we're seeing is that is having to grow, and there really aren't a lot of options for affordable housing. And that's very challenging. So you know, the, there's hopes that refu- there might become landlords that are are refugee sensitive and can help refugees learn how to do some of the things that are associated. If you've lived in a tent in a refugee camp and all of a sudden you have a home with a lawn, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how to do this. Or, you know, just even understanding where garbage goes and taking it out to the curb or You've maybe never used a microwave or a computer. You know, those are a really challenging things. So so economic stability is really a challenge for refugees. That's why the car seats and some of the things that we do, one of the gaps that we determined several years ago was um, women didn't have the menstrual supplies that they needed. And they needed... and. It, it, there's now a term called period poverty and there's a policy group that helped Utahns become more aware of the challenge of not having those things. And maybe Amanda, you can tell, tell a little bit more about what we've been doing to help refugee women with period poverty. Um, well, so most of what we do at Utah Refugee Connection is, is very, it's community donation based. So when this, uh, when this need was uh, recognized, Amy turned to the community and our community is amazing. If you put up the flag and tell them that there's a need, that people really rally. And, and so we started collecting menstrual supplies and then women could come in um, and get those supplies each week, which would 
often be for for that woman and her daughters. Um, and now, because of the different uh, policies that have been, well, we've been made aware, awareness is really the key, right? And um, so now um, teenagers are able to get, get those supplies through their um, high schools generally, and, and it's becoming a little bit easier. So we went from seeing a huge need. We would have, I don't know, 50 to 100 women um, each day come through, not each day of the week, but we're open on Thursdays to have refugees come in. But we'd have so many women coming specifically just for menstrual supplies. And that has tapered off and the numbers have gone down as those things have been um, made easier. It's easier for them to um, obtain those things. And so we have seen things improve that way. We still do offer those items. But um, teenagers are able to get them at high, in their high school, and also um, there's other ways for them to get them as well. I think, you know, what you don't realize, and, and men maybe are more uncomfortable talking about this, but if you don't have what you need for your period, you don't go to work. You don't go to classes. You don't leave your home. And so it puts you farther behind. Um, and also in some of these cultures, there's some real stigma surrounding menstruation. And so they're uncomfortable asking for it. So we have a big wall that has all the different things and it's out in the open and it's, in, it's opened up conversation and it's helped these women feel more comfortable talking about their bodies and about those natural things that are just part of life. You know, we have toilet paper in bathrooms and I even saw in your bathroom here now you have, you know, tampons and pads just for that, you know, instance for where a woman doesn't have what they need. But, um, you know, obviously there's so many different um, challenges that refugees face here and, you know, the safety component is critical. You know, if you we've had individuals that don't know that you can call 911 here. And, you know, I remember one of the first families that I met, um, I was asking the mom what she loves the most about the United States. And it was in some of my first days of the job. I've been doing this about 10 years. Um, the daughter was translating for me and the mom said, I love that I can have my babies in a place where they can save them meaning I'm grateful I can go to a hospital and I can have care for my children and have an opportunity to birth a child and not worry as much about my health and their health. And I, that was really an eye-opening thought. And another thing she said is I'm grateful to be in a place where I don't have to run from the enemy. I mean, how many times were we worried about running from an enemy, you know? Um, so, you know, some of the things that you learn as you engage with this population is that we take a lot for granted. Yeah, I mean, yeah, certainly so. And one of the things I thought was really cool, because I actually did get the opportunity to go out and tour your guys' share house, is just everywhere you turn, there's like resources or some way they could better themselves or like provide sort of the gaps that like you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. And I just, for me, that was just a really cool experience because I know it goes obviously beyond car seats. That's just what I know about mm -hmm, and yeah. menstruation things. You explained that when we were there, but like what other resources do you guys provide? Oh, well, it's funny. Someone, you know, occasionally we get bikes, but we don't ever want to give a bike without a helmet <laughs> because they're, they, they might not even know that what a helmet is and use it. And then you know, we could give them a bike, but the reality is they're never going to go buy a helmet mm -hmm. or very rarely or making sure they have a lock for their bike or, you know, people will say, oh, can we donate a bike? It's not in great condition. I'm like, no, don't give it to us. If it, the tires don't work, they're not going to be able to go take it for a tune up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of things. So, you know, there's, there's so many things that we're trying to do to help them feel more comfortable here. And like I said, feel safe, seen, and supported. One of the one of the the biggest, actually, probably resources that we're able to provide are we offer um, cleaning supplies. We have a, we have two different kits. One's personal 
kit, so personal hygiene items, and then also cleaning supplies. And so as they attend classes, then they earn a voucher that they can come and get those supplies because the, if they still have um, food benefits, those are not covered. You can't buy diapers with your WIC, which is surprising. So we have this opportunity for them to be able to come and earn diapers and wipes and get some other supplies that they need. Yeah. One thing that's interesting about the cleaning supplies. So if you, like Amanda said, if you don't have food stamps or if you have food stamps, you cannot buy um, laundry soap, dish soap, um, hand soap. Uh, Those are all basic things to keep you healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're choosing between buying food or buying disinfecting wipes or cleaning supplies, you're going to choose food. So, you know, when we, the 75% of the individuals we serve that get these kits have to go to 16 hours of classes. And then the other 25% are ones that are referred to us for emergency services. And so we feel like we do a really good job um, working to help them be educated about things, but also have the resources that they need. Like I said, making sure if we're going to give them, you know, uh, a bike, they have a helmet Mm. or a lock or a way to, to, to have what they need because we're never going to assume that it's going to be easy for them. One of the reasons to um, we started doing car seats is anytime you refer them to another location for a service, the chance of them getting there drops significantly. Um, if they have to call and speak with someone in English to set up an appointment and go to a location, they may or may not have a car. It's so much more of an obstacle for them. So anything we can do, to educate them and make it convenient is key. That's why the car seat program is critical. Um, like I said, when when you see families that want and they're trying to get their families to, to school or different places and they don't have a car seat, instead of assuming they don't care, making sure that we come from, let's educate them and help them with the resources that they need to be as safe as they can be. A question, do you, so of the other resettlement services here in Utah, I can think of the Catholic Community Services, um, the International Rescue Committee, the Asian Association of Utah, a couple of the ones you that I have your in mind. stuff, good job. I, I had to do my research before good coming here. <laughs> okay. Um, do, do they provide any, uh, how, how much do you interact with them okay, when so it comes I'm gonna to Okay, so I'm going to say some things. We are so collaborative. Last year, we interacted with 65 different entities. Wow. So we know no one organization can do it all. When refugees first get here, there are um, typically two organizations that do the resettlement and the first, you know, 30 to 30 days to a year is IRC, International Rescue Committee, and Catholic Community Services. And now there's also an organization up in um, Cache Valley um, that resettle and they set up the apartments, get them going. They, they give them um, information about, you know, how they can access health benefits, food benefits. But the idea is to help them get on their feet as quickly as possible. So we defer to those organizations when they first get here, but then there's a huge network of providers that help with um, the English Skills Learning Center helps with English. We have Utah Health and Human Rights that helps individuals that have been tortured. Um, we have so many women of the world that helps really vulnerable women. And I feel like if the whole team is healthy, you know, if you have a football team and your quarterback's bad, things are going to be rough. So if we can keep the whole community healthy and we can engage, everyone can play their role. And like I said, we're a gap filler. So if someone's already doing something well, we'd rather refer the person to that organization and let them do that work. And then we're kind of who people call when they don't know what to do. But all of these organizations meet monthly and we try and work in a collaborative way because there's no way one one group can do it all. And we're really, I'm really grateful that there are so many organizations that offer support to refugees because what they've been through is 
unfathomable to most of us. And I would hope if I were in a similar situation that those where I went would offer the kind of support and help that I would need. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I met you guys at a highway safety office. You guys really do reach out for any sort of connections you can make in order to best serve refugee communities. Cause I remember sitting on that table and it just kind of being like, you know, I'm just the lone Utah safety council guy in a room of highway safety office people. Then you guys are like, well, I'm more interested in what he has to talk about. And I'm like, that's surprising. That's the first I've ever been acknowledged at these meetings. Yeah. And then we got immediately on board talking about car seats and how we could best support you guys in the refugee communities. And so basically what I'm segueing into is if there's any listeners that we have, what kind of supplies would most benefit the refugee communities they could possibly donate? So, um, you know, there are so many ways to get involved and our goal is to always help people learn about, serve and give um, in meaningful ways. A lot of people have an idea of what they think refugees need, but the reality is there are very specific needs that, that do need to be met. Um, you know, furniture is frequently needed by Catholic Community Services and IRC. Um, we don't take furniture. Um, we do need um, employers that are um, have employee I- employment opportunities that could benefit those that are second language speakers and that are sensitive to how much they um, could help a refugee just better their life. Um, there's a, a true need for landlords too that may be willing to offer some assistance with um, uh, not free rent but maybe rent that's that's not market value for a certain amount of time to help these individuals Um, at our share house we collect a very specific cleaning kit and hygiene kit and you can find more about about those on serverefugees.org and then our social media feeds we post something almost every day not just for us but like if someone's interested in foster care for refugee teens there's about a hundred teens that came from refugee um, backgrounds that need foster care. They didn't come with parents. Can you imagine coming as a 14-year-old from another country without parents um, who might have been killed in warfare? Um, Then, you know, we we get lots of different requests. Like um, there's a South Sudanese community that's really tall, and the boys get asked all the time if they play basketball. And some of them played a little bit. They're like, we need some coaches. So we helped them find coaches. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, we need some help with finding a place to practice. So we helped them find a practice place. And then they started to be really good and wanted uniforms. So, you know, you can never discount your skill. I had a magician once call me and I'm like, I don't know if we're ever going to need a magician. Mm -hmm. But then like a week later, someone said, hey, we're... um, At our community center, we have a lot of refugee parents and we want to do something fun with the kids. Is there an activity or something we could do? And that magician came in handy. So like, you know, our, my favorite thing is when someone has a skill set in a certain level or a certain area, finding a way to match that skill set with something that could be done in the refugee community. But, you know, going to our website, serverefugees.org is super helpful Um, following us on social media on serve refugees on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then, you know, the most people that are new in our community, whether they're a refugee, just need a friend. So watching out for someone that's new and just acknowledging what they might be able to offer in your life and then um, helping those in our community feel safe, seen, and supported. And then we discover ways to include them and then they become kind of a cherished part of our community. So that's, that's my advice. Amanda, do you have anything to add to that? No, you always say it the best. We (laughs) call it share house magic because the example about the magician, it just, things just always line up, whether the cart or the horse show up first, there's a way that it can be utilized to really help some somewhere in the greater community. Yeah. And like I said, when we discovered this need for car seats, Um, We knew there were other organizations that maybe could help with either education or providing the car seats because all of a sudden we went from 100 car seats to last year, 250 car seats, and we'll probably be up to 400 car seats. And 
you know, people donate car seats off our registry, but 400 car seats off a registry is a hard ask. Mm -hmm. So when there are other organizations that can help us that are in the same arena, like the safety council helping provide safety for the general community, you know, we align in that area. So let's work together collaboratively to make that happen. And the ultimate benefit is that the people on the ground level that we're trying to serve actually benefit from it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're grateful. We're thrilled to partner with people that make a difference. I I guess uh, one of my last few questions that I have or just last question would be, how could... uh, Let's say you're just talking to just a general individual who doesn't know much about any of this. You mentioned go to the website, learn. Uh, Would you recommend people come and volunteer? Um, So we have a really cool thing that we do. We have refugee cultural nights that are held quarterly. And we collaborate with Granite School District because 70% of the refugees are educated in Granite School District. And... um, what we do is is we invite the general community and we post about that on our website and our social media feeds. And we typically take a group like the Ukrainians did a really beautiful cultural night where we asked three of the Ukrainians to come and speak about their experience, like why they left their country, what it was like for them, what they felt like when they arrived, and then meaningful ways that that people in the community can make them feel a part of the community. And those are magic because you get to hear from the actual individuals that have gone through this and their perspectives. Our last one was refugee teenagers. Mm -hmm. Um, Man, you know, being a teen is hard, but being a teen that has a refugee background can be really challenging. And it was enlightening to hear hear some of their stories. Um, One of my favorite ones was when uh, a refugee said, you know, when when I was a teenager in my country, my dream was to stay alive the next day. And he said, I'm grateful now my kids here have the opportunity to dream and have real dreams like becoming a pilot or a teacher. So those cultural nights are really magic and they'll start again um, in the fall and we'll post about those. And then you know, look for opportunities. If you know someone that's already helping refugees in some some way, consider asking, hey, what are you doing? How could I be helpful? And start with someone maybe that you know, and then, you know, look for opportunities to volunteer with us or with any other organization that's serving refugees. Perfect. I appreciate it. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Do we have any staff questions for the Q&A portion of it? I haven't got you guys your own very chair or in the car seat (laughs) seat. Okay. We have a taker. Hopefully we answered a lot of them, but sometimes when you share information, you you have people with more questions. Yeah, I got my official clipboard out and everything with all my questions, and then you would answer like five in one go, and I'm like, well, (laughs) don't need this after all. (laughs) Um, So, hi, I'm Yvette. I am the emergency care program manager here. So I guess my question would be, is there a need for first aid, CPR, and AD training? Oh, that's a good one. So, um. The Refugee Service Office with the state um, frequently has workshops for men and women, um, and usually they're coming covering the basic, you know, basic things that refugees need when they first arrive. But I think over time, that could be something that's really incredibly helpful. Um, so I think connecting you with the right people at the state level that might be able to offer that. Um, I think when you think about uh, newcomers and refugees when they get here they're so dear in the headlights they're not thinking a lot about that but I do think it's really critical they understand they can call 911 in an emergency and maybe some basic things some of my favorite stories are ones where I'm maybe sick or have something wrong and they they give me their their medicinal background about what I can do to solve it and sometimes it does and sometimes I'm like that's a little out there Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they come from different backgrounds. But right. I think that's a really good question. I always worry about when we had the earthquake, what refugees would do in those situations. And I, I think many Utahns are prepared if there's something where you can't go to the store. But when you are just 
each day barely having what you need, that's a little bit harder. Um, but hopefully as they get on their feet, they can learn more about um, CPR and some of those basic things. We had an experience with a family who their son was in dire need of medical attention and they didn't know what to do. So they were relying on trying to get a hold of a case manager who was overwhelmed. So it really does come down to, and in the end, it was a tragic result. Um, it does come down to they really don't understand how the basics of our medical system work. So that could be a really good place to begin. And then, and then the CPR and emergency. Okay. Um, Good question. One, one more question. Okay. Um, do they have access to AEDs or do they know what those are? Mm. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they have no, no idea. idea. Okay. Mm. But hopefully over time they'll learn. Okay. We maybe mm. could use some, some, some training on, on the, the, those machines <laughs> yeah. as well. Okay. All right. I will be in contact. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Thank good. you. <laughs> You know, it's all about the continuum of care. Like, mm -hmm. it's such a wide range of things that people, we often take for granted that Very we much. need to be successful and be healthy. You know, first aid CPR training, AED, things like many of oh, us. smoke detectors. Uh, smoke like, detectors. You know the smoke detectors uh, beeping in your house. And they probably panic. Like, it's like, what does this know. mean? What does we this mean? We actually, this, I mean, this is sometimes how rudimentary it is, is a family will get resettled and the resettlement agencies try and train them about everything in their house. But we had refugees that came in December that were freezing and cold, and they didn't know that a thermostat is in your home to change the temperature. So, like, sometimes it's like, oh, my gosh, but that's something we just know that, that they, I mean, if you've lived in a HUD or in a refugee camp, you don't have a thermostat. So just sometimes, you know, yes, an AED and, and, and emergency kinds of things like CPR, but like they're so dear in the headlights beginning that sometimes you have to wait for a little while to them for them to be accustomed to something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you mentioned all like the knowledge gaps that like we think that they are lacking because they're just so like second nature to us growing up in a community like this. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the thermostat, for example, like for us, we've always had those and yeah. someone just being thrust into this full situation. Now you have to figure out a thousand different things plus that. Well, and they get <laughs> overwhelmed. Like there's only so much your brain can take. Like I love it when my kids are like, give me your phone. You, you don't know how to do this. Just give me your phone and they'll show me and they make it like I'm such a like I don't know anything. And I'm like, listen, I didn't grow up having all this technology at my fingertips and refugees are much the same. You know, if you haven't had some of those things, you, you just don't know. So mm -hmm. as we help them along and, and have patience with where they're at and we in, increase their ability to understand and, and enlighten them with different ways to be safe in your community, it's super helpful. Yeah. yeah. Do we have any other uh, audience questions from staff for Q&A? I have a question for you guys. Oh, okay. sure. My question is, did you learn anything new? Uh, you yeah. know, I would say yes, but not exactly in the way that you might expect. Uh -huh. So for me, since I've been familiar with a lot of this stuff already before, a lot of this has been pretty second nature to yeah. me. But something that I'm learning more and more, and I think that this is indicative, is how much more care and how much more attention is being put into helping refugees. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's something that I think I didn't quite understand the scope, at least here in Utah, mm -hmm. when it comes to the amount of organizations, the amount of people that go in to try and help these people. I think that's something that's been very new to me, is to mm -hmm. learn that you know these services, these individuals, these people who care, they are out there. You just got to look a little bit. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and when whenever I have the opportunity to share, um, I always try and and voice um, some of the thoughts of of refugees and my friends because they so seldom have a voice. And so as we share information, I'm always very cognizant about my role in giving voice to them when frequently they don't have a voice and also educating people. So as you interact with others and there's misconceptions about refugees, you better understand. Like now, you know, when they get here, they're expected to work. You know, the difference between a migrant and a refugee or a displaced person. And then you become a better advocate in helping them fill this 
safe, seen and supported and, you know, trying to to help curb some of the misunderstandings that there are and stereotypes about refugees is really critical. So I always feel like even though coming to speak on a podcast is a little intimidating, it's also a beautiful opportunity to give a voice to those that rarely have a voice. So we're appreciative of your time and, and we're so appreciative of the help with car seats because it'll make a huge difference for those families. For sure. And I look forward to working with you guys next year as well, the next Mother's Day event and everything. So we're here to help and thank you for stopping by and for everything you do. We appreciate it. Yep. And uh, Brandon, our podcast tech over here says I suck at outros. So if you wouldn't mind attempting an outro for me. An outro. My (laughs) outro would be... um, as you engage with different individuals in the community um, that you have a a great opportunity to make a difference, whether you're acting as someone on the safety council or just as a good human. Um, There's a beautiful quote that I love that says, if you've had success in your life, you've also had luck. And if you have luck, you owe a debt, not only to your gods, you owe a debt to the unlucky. And there are a lot of unlucky people in our community. Refugees are some of them simply because of where they were born. So if you've had success, you have to realize you've had luck. And like I said, with luck comes obligation, you owe a debt to the unlucky. So how'd I do on that? Beautifully said. (laughs) And that's where we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much.